بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبيجن ريم الله الله all praise and glory belongs to Allah Lord of the worlds and may His finest peace and blessings be upon the one whom He sent as a mercy to the worlds our messenger Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم so it's not very difficult turning on the news or the news feed and getting the feeling that this ummah is just so weak and so behind and so oppressed and so victimized and so disadvantaged. Just feel like sometimes this ummah of ours has become a non-factor, no will of its own, kind of like a feather in the wind, no determination, no competence. And if you keep watching and if you keep scrolling, this could totally destroy your psyche, like your state of mind or your state of heart. You can just become totally jaded by everything that you see. And our religion, there's a very Quranic concept and a very prophetic concept that shatters that. That I want to spend, inshallah, the next few minutes discussing. You know, some people, inspirational speakers, they actually word this very same concept in a very clever way in English. And so I'll give that to you first. Maybe it'll help you remember it. They say it is actually your attitude, not your aptitude that determines your altitude. Everybody got that? So basically what that means is, it's not really about your resources, your potential. It's not really about your talent, your skill, your aptitude, your ability. Rather, it's more about your fiery ambitions, your unwavering resolve, your positive thoughts of Allah, your firm trust in Him that will effect positive change in this ummah. When the Sahaba came complaining to the Prophet ﷺ about the state of the ummah, he said, listen, People before you were split in half, and their skin was ripped from their bones, ripped from their flesh, and Allah will fulfill His promise to this ummah. You're just being impatient. And this is very natural. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, A human being was created impatient, hasty. So it's part of our nature to kind of be fixated on the end goal. We want to fast forward to the last chapter in the book. But if you don't control that, it could be extremely devastating. It could be extremely paralyzing. I heard a Muslim psychologist recently say, if I had to diagnose the Muslim Ummah, I would diagnose them with collective depression. She said, because in existential psychology, clinically speaking, Depression is described as the gap between where you are and where you think you should be. And freezing there. Like you're on top of a mountain that you don't want to be on. And you're looking where you think you should be, the top of another mountain, and you can't help but just lock your gaze on the bottomless pit between those two mountains. And you just, you're like, just what's the point? You become totally despairing, totally fatalist. And your inability to look up causes you not to realize that there's a bridge right there. That is the dilemma of our ummah. And so Allah Azza wa Jal protected us from the Achilles heel of human nature in this regard by teaching us an attitude towards ourselves and then an attitude more importantly towards Him that can actually start getting the wheel to turn in the right direction. An attitude towards yourself. When Allah says, وَلَا تَهِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا Do not be weak, do not grieve. What do you mean don't be weak? How is He asking me something not in, ability, in my ability? You're right. Allah is not asking you something outside of your ability. Think a little deeper. When Allah tells you don't be weak, Meaning there's an aspect of weakness that's in your ability to put behind you, to bury, to stomp out, which is the feeling, the attitude of weakness, the feeling of being defeated. 
just as our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to us, Ihris ala ma yanfa'u, wasta'in billahi wa la ta'ajiz. Be keen on, capitalize on the things that would benefit you, that which is fruitful, and keep your trust in Allah and do not feel powerless. It is not allowed for you to feel powerless. That is what Allah is telling you. That is what the Prophet ﷺ is telling you. That attitude is haram. How's that? Umar ibn Khattab used to warn the people of falling into this and he would say, don't you dare just sit there in your place and say, oh Allah provide for me because you all know that the sky does not rain gold and silver. And Imam Ahmad rahimahullah heard about a bunch of people that just sat in the masjid saying Allah will provide for us. We have put our trust in God. He said, these are a people that have no idea what knowledge is. They don't even know the smell of knowledge. He said, didn't they open the book of Allah and read in the Quran, and shake towards you the trunk of the palm tree. Ripe edible dates will fall upon you. Allah is saying to Maryam السلام, who just gave birth, even if she hadn't just give birth, given birth, if she was a man that was a bodybuilder in the world's strongest man competition, who shakes a, the trunk of a palm tree? This is a lesson for anyone to read the Quran to see crystal clear. Allah is telling you, engage reality. You must refuse to become a person that just watches from the sidelines. Some of us, many of us, give up our duties. We don't fulfill our duties to ourselves or to the ummah because we think that flipping through the news and even pulling out a few tears is enough. As if this ummah is a soccer game, as if this ummah is a movie, because we do that with movies as well, don't we? Don't we drop a few tears sometimes? When this team wins and this team loses, and that character dies, and that character is found and has a reunion, Allah Azza wa is telling you, you're not allowed to treat the ummah, treat reality this way. To just be a bystander, marginalized on the sidelines of the real world. You know, our issue as an ummah is not the impossible things that we wish we could have right now. Our real issue as an ummah are the very possible things that we are distracted from, that we are neglecting. It's not the impossible that we wish we can have. Syria will not come back overnight. Are we agreed or not? Burma will not be safe overnight, yes or no? And Masjid al-Aqsa will not be liberated overnight, yes? Apartheid against the Uyghur Muslims in Eastern China will not end overnight. Stefan Clark will not be the last one. Systematic racism on the minorities, especially in the inner cities, will not end overnight. But our contribution, incremental change, our work towards these causes cannot wait another night. That's what our deen teaches us. You busy yourself with serving people, protecting the lives of the innocent and the vulnerable, protecting the faith of the Muslims that are doubting, caring for the widow and the needy and the orphan, educating the masses, developing the generations of tomorrow. That is our duty, that we cannot have rosy dreams that distract us from the items at hand. You know, as one of them said, the key to a person's happiness and the key to escaping life's endless disappointments and the key to actually being productive, not just settling for slogans and hashtags, is for you to find regular, repeated, tiny accomplishments to cause change to happen in things, small things that most people consider insignificant but they are a huge deal to those that you're doing them for. So what that means is that if you want to be happy, number one, and you want to get the momentum going, the energetic cycle to start, and it might just as well add up after a while, just go find your niche, go find your circle of influence, go find the missed opportunities. 
how did your Prophet وسلم, change the world anyway? Anas in Sahih al-Bukhari says, we lost our breath, Anas, young Anas. The elderly Prophet وسلم, in Medina, we lost our breath catching up with him when he ran to the house of that Jewish boy that used to serve him. As that Jewish boy was dying, and he said to him, say la ilaha illallah. And in a moment of parental compassion, a moment of honesty, the young boy looked at his father, who is not a Muslim, and his father said to him, Atir Abu Qasim, obey Muhammad. And so he says, La ilaha illallah, and he dies upon Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ walks out with his face beaming, saying, Alhamdulillah, alladhi anqadahu min al nar. Praise be to Allah who saved him from the fire. Think about that for a second. This young man, for the head of state to visit him. Why? He wasn't going to join the taxpayers list. He's not going to be paying zakah. He's not going to join the Muslim army and defend Islam. He's not going to be doing, but it was a huge deal for the one it was done for. You know, Uqba bin Nafi rahimahullah, was of those credited for bringing the light of Islam all across North Africa and paving the way to the golden age that will soon come in Andalusia, in Muslim Spain. You know what his attitude was? Expending his all. They say that when he got to a river, the river Tangier, he waded with his horse until the water was up here to his horse. And he said, Oh Allah, you know that if this sea was not here, I'd go further and further spreading your light to the world. Why did he do that? He knows he's not going to walk on water. Why doesn't he just say it from the shore? Why is he maxing out? Muhammad al-Fatih rahimahullah, for 800 years people have dreamed and tried, beginning with some of the Sahaba, to be the fulfillment of the, prophet, the prophethood, the prophecy of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, that Constantinople, Istanbul would be liberated. Who did it? It was on the hands of Muhammad al-Fatih. Do you know what his mother says? She says, Kuntu I used to feed him the wounds of his ummah along with the milk. In other words, when I was nursing him, she said, I used to bring him to the shore that he would ride the sea for that famous feat. I used to, when he was an infant, bring him to the shore and tell him the struggles of his ummah as I was nursing him. Bedtime stories. Don't underestimate them. That is your capacity, then that is your duty. And there are so many examples of this until this present day. You know, Dr. Abdurrahman al-Sumayt, some of you may know him, he died a few years ago, a Kuwaiti physician, spent the last 29 years of his life in the jungles of Africa, in the villages of Africa, in downtrodden Africa, doing, trying to do his best. 11 million people are credited to have become Muslim because of him. 5,700 masajid and 200 Islamic centers and another 200 hospitals and clinics, 9,500 wells, 51 million masahib, mushaf being distributed. You can do more than you think. It was told to me last year that one of the young blessed women that went to visit the Syrian refugees and came back determined to expend her all after seeing the camps, she by herself shocked herself. The brothers from Helping Hand were telling me she collected $500,000 on her own. You can do that and more. You're just selling yourself short sometimes. Our problem is that we let Shaytan tell us, what are you going to do? What's the point? No matter what you do, it's just another drop in the ocean. And our attitude is supposed to be, and what else is an ocean but a pile of drops? Our attitude should be, even if it's just a drop in the ocean, no harm, because our Prophet wasallam gave us endless hope. He said to us, if the day of judgment is starting and you have a sapling, a baby tree in your hands, and you're able to plant it before the day of judgment starts, then plant it. Think about that. That sapling is gonna be gone in a moment. It's gonna vanish, but it's vanishing does not prevent it from showing up in your scale of good deeds. Does not prevent you from being liable or able to act on something because those moments were in your capacity. So remember the sapling. And in the next three, four minutes, because I have to close now, but Sheikh Yasir, he 
touched this on the lecture before, your attitude towards Allah. It's not just your attitude towards yourself. Your attitude towards Allah will determine your altitude above and before anything else. You know, if we look around too much, we get consumed by the challenges. We get consumed by the negativity. And that's why Muslims way too often are busy talking about conspiracy this and conspiracy that. And it's straight up paranoia sometimes. That's because we're looking around too much. If we were just to look up a little bit, or look up through looking into the Qur'an, you would find a God that is most capable. A God that could change the world overnight and we are certain of that. A God that is also most wise. A God that is the best of planners, subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe in Him, Jalla Jalalu. That is our greatest asset. We believe that everything we do in the conference and everything we get inspired to do from the conference this weekend, perhaps if we connect right with Allah and assume the best of Him, one dua in the depths of the night from a pure heart can outweigh it all, can change the course of history. Don't we believe that? We must absolutely believe that. You know, the reason why we have to keep reiterating this is because the Prophet ﷺ said to us, right? Like, tie your camel and put your trust in Allah. They are two sides of the same coin, by the way. So what you're going to do is expend your all while not believing that anything you do is ultimately going to be affected without Allah. Like, I believe fire burns, so I'm going to do everything in my power to not burn myself. But I do believe at the end of the day that if Allah wants the fire not to burn me, the same way it didn't burn Ibrahim السلام, it's not going to burn me. I believe that a knife is dangerous. I'm not going to subject myself to a sharp blade. But if Allah wants, that blade will not cut me the way it did not cut Ismail السلام. You know what that does for you, by the way? That liberates you, gives you so much tranquility and confidence to work when you're liberated from thinking everything is in your hands. That's a ruse, by the way. That's a fatal trick. You know when people say, if you just put your mind to it, you can get it done. We don't believe that as Muslims. We believe if you put your mind to it, you will get it done, inshallah. Isn't that true? One person said, I used to believe in destiny, but now I believe in hard work. Our Prophet وسلم, said, Kullu shay'in bi qadr, hatta al-ajz wal case. Everything is destined by God, even your ability and your inability. So you work hard as if everything is in your hands, while fully certain that you and others are in Allah's hands. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And remember the hijrah of your Prophet ﷺ. He did everything he could, was thorough and planned and went the opposite direction and they still got to the cave, didn't they? But then Allah blinded their hearts from simply looking into the cave. That's what we believe as Muslims. You know, I read recently that life is like riding a bicycle. Albert Einstein says this. The way to keep your balance is just to keep going. And there is some beauty to this, and there is some truth to this. But what if you keep going in the wrong direction? And that's why I found more beautiful than Einstein's statement is the hadith of Shaddad ibn, ibn Aws radiallahu ta'ala anhu narrated by Ahmad and others where the, pro, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say, Allahumma inni as'aluka thabata fil amr wal azimata ala rush. Put that in your toolbox. He used to say, Oh Allah, I ask you for stability in affairs, in matters, and to be determined upon doing the right things. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik shadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Jazakallah khayr, everybody.